Hello, everybody. Today, we are talking about creative ways to draw fan art. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here, Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Well, I think you're a little predictable, Jordan. <laughs> Yep, yep, I had to start off with this. I would love to wear this the rest of the stream, but one, I can only see about four inches in front of me, and two, you couldn't hear me talk. So, yeah, I thought I'd do this to uh, bring up the comment that certainly had about bringing up Spider Man. I'm doing more than bringing up Spider Man, I'm being him, and I'm gonna draw him. So, there's that. <laughs> Nice to know some things in the world never change. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got. These are my reference. I posted it in the Discord and post live streams if you guys want to draw along with me. I'm sure this was very predictable for about 99.8% of you. <laughs> Wouldn't you say that Spider-Man is almost your, your default? <laughs> that and Avatar, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I think Spider-Man's a little bit more ubiquitous. I think more people are familiar with him because of how old uh, the, the character is. Aang is only about 15 years old. No, well, 18 years old, I think. So, yeah. He is multi-generational. Yeah. That's Spidey. <laughs> Tell us in the chat who here going to draw some fan art with us because we are doing a fan art workshop in May that I'm really excited about. And one thing that I do for the workshops is I try to provide as many resources as possible for people. So when we scheduled the fan art workshop, I was like, dude, we need more resources. <laughs> so I figured let's just pop some of this in here because I wrote a post, I think it was two days ago, about I've changed my mind about fan art, Jordan. Yeah, so what made you change your mind? You! Yeah. <laughs> I'm so honored. I'm so, so honored. It's you and Kat. What, what specifically? What do we do? Because I'm sure we're not the only ones to bring up fan art being cool to you before. So what is it about us? Is it because you love us more? Yes. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the main thing is that we did those streams where you and Kat showed your childhood artwork. Uh -huh. And I noticed you, you had so much fan art and so did Kat. And now I didn't grow up doing fan art. Maybe I wasn't cool or something, but I saw how fan art was for you and Kat an entry point into becoming an artist. Mm -hmm. And I realized, wow, that, that's a really pivotal moment for a young artist to have. Yeah, I, I think it just comes naturally. You want to draw the things that you like. And I mean, that's how I learned, like, because I started drawing when I was two and three years old. And, you're not going to sit me down with an anatomy book and, um, you, you know, explain proportion to me and all that. You're like, no, I'm just going to draw whatever character I feel like. And when I was a kid, it was Buzz Lightyear, Hercules, Simba, um, you know, a bunch of Disney characters, um, Spider-Man, obviously. But that didn't happen until I was a little older. Um, but, yeah, that's how it all starts, though. And to me, everybody needs an entry point because... A lot of art is really challenging and intimidating. If you're learning by yourself, you don't know where you begin. And it's like if there's one thing that can just take down a couple barriers, it's like great, right? Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people can uh, can grow and develop from that. And I think you'll probably gain uh, quite the community by by doing something like fan art. So. Yeah, the one thing you just have to be careful about is how, if you can sell it or not. <laughs> That's a yeah. probably a conversation for another stream, but uh, I know sometimes people get worried about that, and there's very levels to that. So, yeah, but for drawing it for yourself, for your own personal learning experience, I think it's perfectly fine. Well, I think for a lot of people, 
the selling is not immediate. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of people who sell, but there are a lot of people who are just drawing for fun. And right. in that circumstance, it's totally fine. And we do have a stream, everybody. If you just look up Art Prof fan art, it'll pop up. And we talk about, is it okay to make fan art? And the answer is yes. But the selling thing obviously does get a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. So tell us in the chat who here has done lots of fan art, who here used to, but doesn't anymore. And who here is like me and just started a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a bunch of people who say it was their entry point, like Sonnet. Amanda says Dragon Ball Z. And oh. Seven Angelic says anime. Ginger Cell says it's great practice. Can you elaborate on that, Jordan? Well, when you're doing fan art, first off, you're you're learning if, if you're trying to max the style of the project, especially, you're learning a lot about how to work in a studio setting because especially for someone like myself working in an industry in the entertainment field you have to be able to match the style that everyone else is working in already and so when you've kind of prepped yourself for that automatically by doing fan art it makes it a lot easier um two i think it always helps when you draw something you're passionate about for example if you're in a class not many people like doing uh the assignments that teachers give them because there's not as much passion in a lot of those things or it's hard to insert that in but when you get something that you're actually invested in that you really like, or like me with Spider-Man or Clara with uh, Pedro Aaron Pascal. Aaron debate. Huh? Aaron debate. Yeah, I don't know who that is, but um, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, then, then it makes it a lot more fun, right? And you're like, oh, it would be so cool if I could do this, and this, and this. So I think it really changes the, uh, the overall environments that you're um, drawing in if you can do that. Yes, or, or maybe another way to put it is you draw what you're obsessed with. <laughs> yeah, draw what you're obsessed with. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Don't let people judge you for it. Oh my gosh, Jordan, it's so bad. It's so bad. Like, <laughs> what? My, my Aaron Tveit, it's the obsession. It's so, it's so over the top right now. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even know who that is. This is the first time I'm hearing oh my, God. oh my God, Jordan, let me educate you. <laughs> okay, great. So in case people don't know what the heck I'm talking about, Jordan, this is educational. I did mood boards. Do you see the mood boards? <laughs> I do see they're, it. They're very important. I spent, you know, I was, I was very conscientious about it. It was very comprehensive. I needed to get as many, oh my God, you guys. <laughs> oh my God, his hair, his hair. It just makes me crazy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> You're something else. Oh my god. Well, you know what the problem is? Okay, so Benedict hasn't had a movie in a while, and he's not having one for a while. Fassbender like dropped off the face of the earth. Like he hasn't had a movie since like 2018. Hugh Jackman is getting pumped for Deadpool 3, which I'm very excited about, but you know, it's gonna take forever. Uh -huh. Although I do want to see his movie The Sun. That just came out, so I'm gonna see that. Who's left? Is that it? Yes. So those are, those are my top three. But so Fassbender got bumped because he hasn't had a movie in so long. So you oh better get a movie out. That's that is something. What a what a qualifier. I know. So anyway, oh, this Aaron debate obsession is so bad. Oh my god, it's so bad. <laughs> really? So some of you may have seen in my Instagram stories I've been documenting trying to prep for this stream. And I've been doing it over several nights. So I started out with these screenshots from this amazing video of him singing Roxanne from the Moulin Rouge, which is like <laughs> so hot. Oh my God, Jordan, I must have watched this clip 500 times. It's so it amazing. Actually, of course it is. And then I went back and I decided I wanted to do something that had a stronger composition. So I did lots and lots of thumbnails, experiments, trying to see how I could get more 
some of the elements from the show. So for example, the rose petals, the windmill, they also have the stage, which is this gigantic heart. So I went through and did those. And then of course I had to test my materials. In this case, I'm using abstract acrylic paints by Sennelier. And then <laughs> I did even more and I scanned the paintings into Photoshop and did all this for me to see what my options were. So these are now digital sketches where I've just gone in and colored in the background, played with the text. Fan art's a lot of work, Jordan. It is a lot of work. It's so much work, uh, but it's worth it. It's fun. And by the way, everybody, this is my warm up because especially with the inks, these are the inks I'm using. You have to be so bold that I just, I can't start on this. I have to mess around here first and then I can go in and feel a little bit more comfortable because Jordan, I think there is this almost warm up period for a lot of people. For just drawing or doing? Yeah, specific. just drawing in general. Oh yeah, I do warm ups all the time. I've even talked about it on a couple of streams. Um, this is actually kind of my warm up for the day. I haven't drawn at all uh, since I woke up about an hour ago. So, <laughs> hmm. by the way, I want to give a quick shout out to Amanda for the nine dollar ninety nine cents uh, super chat. Appreciate it. And you say gotta grab a gallon of water for this one, <laughs> which I appreciate. Uh, for those who don't get the reference on my live streams on YouTube, whenever I mention Avatar, Spider-Man, or Jack and Daxter, we all play this water drinking game where we just drink water because one, I don't drink alcohol. <laughs> Two, if we were to drink alcohol, we'd probably all die by the end of the stream. So, <laughs> yeah. We could do that here with Hugh and Benedict and Aaron. Oh, we could totally do that. Yeah. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> Because it's like, we'll have a tally. yeah, because, you know, we all should be drinking more water and we say it enough anyway. It's just like, why not? Why not just turn it into a promotion for better health, you know? Exactly. Ram is asking, I don't understand the concept of fan art. Is it an art made about a movie by a fan or just portraits of an actor or artist by a fan? So Jordan, give us your textbook definition. Um, fan art is kind of all of the above. It's just most of the time when we make art, it's usually fulfilling something personal. So it's a personal thing that we decide we wanted to draw or paint or sculpt or whatever. When you're doing fan art, it basically means you're creating an artwork based off of the property or project that's already in existence or that is popular. Um, it's not the same as doing, you know, doing hiring uh, someone hiring you to design a character or something. It's like I just want to draw Spider-Man, so that to me that would be included as fan art. Or I want to draw, you know, Buzz Lightyear. You know, that's fan art or Bugs Bunny, whatever. If you're not hired by that studio to do it and get paid, but you're still drawing it anyway. Anyway, that is pretty much considered to be fan art. But you know what's interesting, Jordan? I do think sometimes labels can change the way people perceive certain artworks. Mm -hmm. Because you know something? All of the thumbnails that I did for this and then the mood boards and collecting all the images, this actually is not dissimilar to if I was doing an editorial illustration, let's say there's a magazine article about this musical Moulin Rouge and you know they have an illustration to accompany it. So the process is not that different, but I think it's the relationship between the artist and the image because I have here in the upper right-hand corner, this is an illustration that was in the New Yorker that was for a review of Moulin Rouge the musical. And you can see the process is similar. They're incorporating elements from the musical. There are colors that are associated with it. But the difference is that the illustrator Ping Zhu 
was hired by the New Yorker. They're not making that artwork because they have an unhealthy obsession with Aaron Tveit. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, I think it's a good distinction because quite honestly, most times in the art field, you're not going to work on things that you particularly like. And yeah. uh, that's the unfortunate truth. I, I know we often get into it because we want to be able to draw and work on the coolest projects. But oftentimes it's like, yeah, like like my industry experience, I could say I probably enjoyed maybe one project that maybe, I, I, one, maybe two. I might be generous with two projects that I've worked on. Um, even though they looked cool and all that stuff, it's very rare to actually enjoy it. So when you're doing fan art, that's what it's all about. So you get to indulge in that way. But the making of it doesn't have to be different. I mean, I, I confess that when I was Academia Ivory Tower Clara, <laughs> I just assumed, oh, people do fan art because they're lazy and they don't want to invent their own characters and they're just copying things. But there's a lot of interpretation involved with fan art, don't you think? Oh, that's that's exactly what happens. And quite honestly, they remake a lot of things anyway. Like how many Batman movies have there been? How many right. interpretations of Alvin the Chipmunks are there or any any comic book character really? And in a way, even though they're creating new stuff, they have to, it's the same process as creating fan art because you have to reimagine these very popular characters and keep the same iconography and yet have a new vision. So it, there's a challenge in that. You know, like if someone came to me today and said, we're working on a new Spider-Man project, but we don't want it to look like anything else that has been done. How do, the question now becomes, how do I do that? And yet, make it so that everyone still sees Spider-Man, you know? I mean, in some ways, I think it's a lot of pressure because people know Spider-Man so well mm -hmm. and they feel very close to this character. But, I mean, that's the challenge there. How do you satisfy the people that know and love the character so well while also bringing in your own voice? Right. That's, that's the biggest challenge. And some interpretations are better than others. You know, like people have been hating on this uh, new Velma show, for example. Um, yeah. I haven't watched it personally, but I've seen people reacting to it. And it's so backwards from what I thought it would be. And, really? Uh, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just from what I've seen, it's just super mean spirited. I don't even think Scooby is in the show. Um, it's just Velma and her dealing with different stuff. I, one thing I thought that was kind of cool, they they changed up the ethnicities of the characters, which I thought was interesting. Like Velma's now East Indian and Daphne oh. is half Chinese and Shaggy is black. You know, so they changed Whoa. stuff. Like that, but um but the characters don't feel like themselves. So Oh really? Yeah, it's just it's kind of awkward. It's not really I, I didn't really find the clips that I saw particularly enjoyable. I'm sure the other mm -hmm. people found it fun, but I, I was like eh. Well, and also uh, there's so many iterations of, okay, let's say in art history, sacrifice of Isaac, okay? Mm -hmm. If you don't know what that is, that's where God is testing Isaac uh, and says, go kill your son. Abraham. And then he's about to kill his, Abraham, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> oh no, the sacrifice of Isaac, Isaac's the son. Abraham's yeah. the son. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So God was says <laughs> to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. So, yeah. Yes. And, and so he's about to kill his son. And then God comes in and says, oh, no, sorry, I'm just testing you. But that that's a biblical story. Mm -hmm. But so many people have painted Abraham and Isaac throughout art history. And everybody has their own take on what Abraham and Isaac look like. Right. So to me, that is not different than people taking Wednesday Adams mm -hmm. and doing a new iteration. Right. Yeah, no, that's 100% true. And I think it's easier with something like a biblical story because we don't know what anyone looked like. We, we don't have reference for that. But, right. um, but when it comes to like a Wednesday or something like that, then we have certain expectations. And I know that can put a lot of people under certain pressure. But I, I, I like those challenges. Those are fun to me. Well, Sentient, I think, sums it up very well. I guess in a way it's just depicting popular iconography of the time you live in, whether it's from an animation studio, an ancient myth, a pop star, etc. Exactly. And so that's where I think fan art gets 
the short end of the stick because it has such a specific contemporary definition. But if you really get to the roots of what fan art is, which is providing your artistic interpretation of a well-known character or person, it's the same thing as Caravaggio's Sacrifice of Isaac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spider-Man's head shape is giving me issues right now. <laughs> he's got so many pressure. He's got so many, like, look at this. He's got so many interesting angles to this head. Yeah. And it's like, how do you, how do you do that? So how oh, these guys are geniuses. Oh, okay. I mean, can't you argue that Spider-Verse is one epic piece of fan art? Pretty much, actually. Um Right. What I think, what I think is so fun about Spire Verse is that they clearly got a lot of inspiration from the comics that created the character. You know, so they they specifically took like actually, if you look here, you know, they're using things like uh, Kirby dots right here, which are very common in uh, comic books. They're using this off uh, kilter lighting and color changing gradations, stuff like that. Like there's a bunch of little techniques that they use to make the film. And uh, this is from the sequel, which I'm so excited for June 2nd. Who's, I don't know who's going to see it with me, but uh, I'm gonna go see it. And so, yeah, it's, it's a big love letter, essentially, the way I picture it. So I, I've crossed over into fan art land because if it means then I got to look at Aaron to vape more. <laughs> I'm all on board for that. <laughs> yep. Could do it as much as you like. <laughs> By the way, in case anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, let me educate you. <laughs> so the reason I got obsessed with him is because I was on TikTok. Because Jordan, I'm obsessed with TikTok now. How about you? <laughs> uh yeah, pretty much. It's bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's so endlessly entertaining. Oh my God. All those stand-up comedy clips. Um so I'm on TikTok and I find this clip of Aaron Tveit. It's on the right hand side in the slide singing Roxanne from Moulin Rouge. So who here has seen the movie? Because I was really obsessed with the movie when it came out many years ago. And I was so obsessed with the soundtrack. So it's like you put a hot man with one of my favorite movie soundtracks. I mean, it's like totally easy <laughs> to see how that happened. And so I watched this clip of him and it's the very end of the song. It's like the most intense part of the song. And it's also like a minor key song, which I love. And I watched that clip. It was, it's like 15 seconds. And I was like, oh my God, this is the hottest thing I've ever seen. Like, I, I don't usually get that excited about people singing because, you know, it's great. I like people singing. But I was like, oh my God, I'm so turned on by this. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I gotta admit, when I was in your class at 18 years old, I didn't think you'd have these conversations 10 years from now. <laughs> from of then. course not. <laughs> no. It's so life, is, life is so weird, Jordan, isn't it? it? It's very strange. Can't really put it together just yet. Even the things, let's say you want to do something and you end up doing it, it, it never, the iteration of it is never what you think it is in your head. Yeah, I think that plagues a lot of artists. I actually know that uh, Michael Jackson had this quote where he said something along the lines of, I am imprisoned by um, like my own concepts. Like basically saying like the thoughts that he had for his music, he could not get out in the actual mm. music. And he was very frustrated by that. He's like, it's never sounding as good as I want it to in, that, in my head. So it's, it's pretty sad, but I kind of relate to it. Oh, I totally relate to that. Um, because I was doing all those thumbnails for the stream today. And it's like, I couldn't stop. Like I kept saying, no, it could be a little, oh no. What if I, and I was like, oh my God, Claire, are you just going to do this for 50 weeks or something? Like I, I could, I could just keep going, right? Yeah, I, I have that problem too. I'm always trying to make things perfect, um, especially with my personal project, shadow boxers and stuff. And, you know, I have so much for it that most people are actually kind of shocked when <laughs> when they realize how much I've done for it. But I'm like, it needs to be perfect because I don't have the, the same limitations at a studio, so I don't have the same timing. 
as everyone else, but I just want to look good. I want to be really cool, you know? That's how it of course. Is. I mean, who doesn't want their work to look good? Right. <laughs> Manette says, I hadn't even heard of fan art as a kid. I grew up in a rural community and the kids who played Magic the Gathering at lunch were, quote, weird. Also, didn't have cable, so lots of cartoons. I never grew up with in morning cartoons because Jordan when I was a kid Saturday morning was like this magical time of the week when all the cartoons were on were all morning and that was my existence on Saturday mornings I've, I've heard that from quite a few 80s babies we had Saturday morning cartoons but at the same time we also had Nickelodeon Disney Channel and Cartoon Network which were just constantly playing stuff so i don't think it was quite the same unfortunately yeah we didn't have that like we just had it all the time um although i do remember when um when we got the uh, the boomerang cable channel and that had all the Hanna Barbera stuff and looney tunes and that was always my favorite because it was so rare to see uh because it was older and oh my goodness i had the best time watching pink panther and bugs bunny and all <laughs> that stuff. it was just excellent i, I really loved those, those days yeah, I grew up with Looney Tunes too, but a lot of kids now haven't seen Looney Tunes, which makes me sad because those cartoons are just genius. Oh, it's so funny. I saw something on TikTok where it just went through a compilation of um, all the times where they just scream. And it was like, what? Like they just go out of character for a second and they're just constantly uh, yelling at each other. It's, it's amazing. And, uh, and then there's that one clip with the owl and he's like, uh, he's like, I love the singer, I love the moon and the tuna and the spring. Do you know that one? No. You ever seen that one? Oh my gosh, it's an older no. one. It's like from 1936, I think. But it's oh. about this owl who just likes to sing and his parents don't want him to. But every time he talks, they're singing. So it's, and he's rhyming. He's like, I love the singer, I love the moon and the tuna and the spring. And then the dun dun, and then the dun dun. Like he just goes in this cadence. <laughs> it's really, That's really so fun. cute. It's amazing. Gloria says, as a teenager without access to art classes, this is a way to learn to draw and was more interesting because there were stars that I was crushing on. I feel you, Gloria. I know what it's like. <laughs> it really helped me learn some drawing skills. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. And Monique says, even some creators that are in the mainstream have placed fan art in their works. For example, in the video game Uncharted, there is art sculptures of Indian culture depicted. Yeah, and sometimes it's an homage, yeah. which is almost a tribute to an artist. For example, does everybody know the Pixar opening where there's a dancing lamp that comes in and, you know, squashes itself? So if you watch Spirited Away, which is a Miyazaki film, there is a scene where there's a dancing street lamp that jumps and makes a similar noise as the Pixar lamp. And that's an homage to Pixar. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. You know, one thing, um, uh, one thing that I learned one time, I went to, um, I went to the studio where they was, where they were making Phineas and Ferb back in 2013. And I got to talk with the, one of the creators, uh, Swampy or Jeff Marsh, but we ever calls him Swampy. And he's told me that, uh, he saw my fan art, he told me to keep doing it because he actually has hired people who made fan art based off of his show. And he said there was one woman or one girl who uh, who did fan art of the characters as they were older and they're like, go find her, hire her, bring her out here. So it happens, it happens. Well, I mean, that makes sense for a studio. If you're gonna work for Phineas and Ferb, you're gonna be drawing Phineas and Ferb at the job. I like this. This is, this is fun. So in case anybody's wondering, <laughs> one of the reasons I'm doing the black right now is because I'm a little terrified to do this live <laughs> because <laughs> I spent so much time preparing 
all the thumbnails and now I'm like really nervous and now I don't know if I want to do it live. <laughs> oh no, you could do it, Claire. I believe in you. I don't know. I feel a little stressed because now that I've done all that prep work, I'm like, oh, it has to be good, Clara. You did all this prep work. You can't screw up now. I, I feel that way all the time on my live streams. I understand. I understand. But you know something? I do need to do this background because does everybody see how there's black all around his head and fingers? Like that has to be black. I know that for sure. And so I think some people might have just started with the face. But Jordan, how does this big black shape affect how I will paint the face? Well, when you're starting off with something like that, you can, you're, you're creating a color in context. I never recommend people starting to do color on just a pure white background, whether it's, especially when it's digital, but even on paper or canvas because your sensibilities when it comes to color are just gonna be slightly off. And um, so I think it's a perfectly reasonable decision to not rush the color on this. Well, and also the edges, oh my God, I love his hair so much. <laughs> his hair is so good, oh my God. Like he has it like kind of long and it just like falls on the side. <laughs> so good in this but uh so the edges of his hair are very important to the personality of the character and so if i have just like hair with a white background it doesn't contextualize the hair because the hair is emerging out of the dark it's very much like a chiaroscuro lighting situation so i just oftentimes find if i just start with that white background, it's actually harder for me. Hmm. Yeah, when I'm doing color, especially if it's something that is uh, not already set in stone, I can't work yeah. on a white background. It's one thing if I know the colors already, then I can just color pick, you know, like my characters or something like that. Or even with Spider-Man, I could probably get away with that right now if, uh, if I get a chance to do color. But um, yeah, it's, it's a whole different ball game. And I do think shape wise, the shape of the text absolutely impacts all of this. So that's what I'm trying to do right now is to create that black background, get some of the shape of the text a little bit more solid. And hopefully that takes long enough that I have to do the face online. Mm. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll try. I really will try, you guys. I'm just working up to it. <laughs> I'm just trying to capture the shapes because one thing with Spider-Verse style is they really exaggerate everything. And mm -hmm. uh, it's not how I would normally draw. I don't exaggerate this much. And so I'm trying to find ways to really change up how the tapers are and the joints and even the shape of the head and stuff. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it's definitely something that I have to work up to. Right. This way. So Amanda's asking, are your acrylics liquid body or heavy body? Okay, so the ones I'm using right now, these are abstract acrylic inks by Sennelier. And they're weird because they're inks, like drawing inks. But the thing is when they dry, they feel like acrylics. Like if you touch this part, it doesn't feel like ink. It really feels like a thin acrylic. And they do have more body than drawing ink. Like drawing ink is very fluid and liquidy. This is not like that. It's sort of like a, I don't know. It feels like somebody put a little flower into the ink or something, something like that. Mm -hmm. But then actually I can show you guys. So these are some of the sketches I did before. Where is it? Okay. So this is one I did a little ways back. So the face is pretty much all the ink, but then these red highlights at the bottom, because I couldn't get them bright enough, I ended up using straight acrylic. So this is the one that I used. It's the same line. It's Sennelier abstract heavy body acrylics. And so then I did another one <laughs> where this is all that ink, but then the red highlights are acrylic. And so I liked how those had a glow because it has that very strong theatrical lighting. 
So mostly the inks, but a little touch-ups of acrylic. Edie is asking, can you explain the purpose of gesture drawing, please? I always feel like I'm wasting my time unless I'm trying to create a final image. So the way I see it, gesture drawing is meant to capture the energy of the pose. I don't think there's anyone here who wants to have a stiff image or a character or a figure who just looks boring. So when you do a gesture, it's a way to get the highest result for the least amount of time. So when you practice doing 30 seconds, a minute, two minute gestures, and you're basically able to create the whole figure and get a really quick understanding of, is this working or is this not? And then you can build off of that rather than spending 45 minutes on a pose, then stepping back and realizing, oh, I should have twisted the, the torso more. I should have done this. And it's, it's a way to save time and be more efficient at the end of the day. But I mean, isn't, Spider-Man, the ultimate gesture character. Yeah, actually, I was in class one time a few years ago, and uh, we were talking about how you can pretty much take poses from any character, with the exception of Spider-Man, because his are so specific. You know, like if I if I had a cool standing pose of a character, it could be Indiana Jones, it could be Darth Vader, it could be Superman, it could be Batman, it could be Wonder Woman. No one will know. But if you're doing Spider-Man with these types of poses. I mean, my goodness, that's going to be pretty freaking obvious. You might be able to get away with this one in the middle here, but this one, no, that that is a spidey pose all the way. So, right, yeah, you just have to have to be aware of that. But yeah, Spider Man is so difficult and so rewarding to draw. And I do think Edie, Eddie, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Um, gesture has a lot to do with movement. So if you have somebody like Spider-Man who is so super dynamic and just swimming all over the place, you can't let him look stiff. Like that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I think oftentimes gesture is there to insinuate the movement and the dynamic quality of that. Kara Sue's asking, how do I upload a drawing to the post stream discussion on Discord? I have a drawing I'd love feedback on. All right, well, to be clear, after this live stream, we are gonna do a stage session and that's where you get to talk to us on voice. Since today is a draw along, you can post your fan art that you do during the live stream for us to take a brief look at. However, we do not critique personal artwork. So please keep that in mind. You, you can share it. I mean, that's fine to show, but we will not be reviewing it during the stage session. Now, if you do want us to critique your work on voice, the best way to do that is to join our Patreon group. It's $20 a month and you can share your art in weekly voice sessions, ask questions, get support, Critiques from me, I don't do critiques in the public channels, but most of all, you get support in a small group of artists. So that's the best way to do it because in the public critique channels, like just so many people, I mean, we have over 11,000 members now, and so it's hard, and I don't do critiques in the public channels. So that's your best option as far as getting it critiqued on voice by staff. Vav is saying, have you tried the different tips they have for those acrylic pouches? It feels like cake decorating. <laughs> I haven't. I mean, maybe they have something on the website, but that's just so much acrylic paint. Like I would just burn right through it. I, I just, I think it's cool, the stuff people do, but I just feel like I can't justify the expense. Honestly, I've found that I run through pencils incredibly quickly. Like I, I will go through half a pencil in one sitting of drawing because I need to tip to be so sharp and I'm constantly sharpening it. So yeah, that, I understand that. I understand that dilemma. Yeah, but pencils are cheaper than acrylic paint. <laughs> I was trying to commiserate with you, but if you don't want to allow me to have that, then it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Victoria, for the super sticker. Oh, and we owe you two animations, everybody. I forgot. We so much appreciate your support. It is incredible to have you all here. What we get from our Patreon, it is still 
our top form of revenue. You wouldn't think it is, but it is. There, there's nothing else we get revenue from that even comes close to the Patreon group. So when you join, you get all kinds of perks. It's like a 24 seven art party in there. We have such a good time. <clears throat> I think I put it off long enough, Jordan. Oh my God. <gasps> you could do it, I believe in you. And so does everyone else. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I should not have said that, huh? <laughs> Karen, I, I shouldn't have done uh -oh, I think there was a lag. Say oh, again. yeah, that's me. My internet has not been cooperating lately. Okay, now now we need to we need to talk Aaron. We have to talk about Aaron for a minute. Who here knows who Aaron Tevade is? He's he's sort of not, you know, he's not Benedict. He's not in Marvel movies and stuff like that. But first time I saw him was in the Les Mis movie, which has Hugh Jackman in it. <laughs> so of course I had to see that. Naturally. But I saw him in that. You're not a musical person, are you, Jordan? I like the Wiz. <laughs> Oh gosh, of course you would because of Michael Jackson. He's the best part of the movie. Don't act like you don't know. <laughs> I know. He's super adorable in that movie. He's the best actor. Everyone else is just so stale. And he's just like, you can't win. It's great. It's fantastic. Oh God, you guys. This scares me even more <laughs> that you're all telling me I can do it. Oh my God. Do we need to use some reverse psychology and tell you that we don't believe you can do it and so you want to prove it to us? <laughs> no, because I'm just <laughs> okay. Plus, I'm not doing it out of spite. If I was doing it out of spite, I'd be like, I'll show you. Oh. But it's not out of spite, so I can't do it. Oh, it's not the same energy. I get it. I know. Okay, I'm just gonna just gonna read some comments for a little while. That's what we're gonna do. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I do like how the Spider-Man image is coming out, though. I'm having fun with this. As well. well, see, that's the other compelling thing for me behind fan art. It's just fun. It's so much fun. I get to, I mean, I get to, I get paid to draw characters and do fan art and all this kind of stuff. It's freaking awesome. Like in class, we have a whole class on how to do stylized characters, and I just draw other styles. It's so much fun. Like, wow, Ellen Doy says, I've been drawing fan art since I watched Pokemon for the first time in 99. I don't do fan art that much now, but it's great when I don't feel like working on art assignments. I know. I'm like, oh, I'll just do some fan art of Aaron. I'm just going to look at his brow. <laughs> oh, my God. Help me, Jordan. Look at the picture. <laughs> in the lower left corner, the way he's sitting is just <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to some of this stuff. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here. I'm just going to sit here and be obsessed with Spider Man some more. Well, like, I, I just haven't had like a big thing of man crushes because, you know, there's only so many times you can watch certain things. I mean, you told me that about Spider Verse that you said you can't watch it too much. Only No, it's not that I can't watch it too much. It's just that I can't watch it while I'm working. And I'm always working. Oh. So that's okay. the issue. Yeah. But you can watch it as many times. Oh yeah. I've I had I've memorized movies by accident before. Like many times. That way did, okay. I tell you, did I ever tell you that? I memorized Prince of Egypt. Oh, I bet you did. I have the Princess Bride memorized. Who who here? What movies do you have memorized? I have that one and parts of Shawshank Redemption, probably. Oh, that's a good movie. I don't think I've ever had that movie's a little too long for memorization for me, but um, but yeah, like when I was a kid, I used to watch Hercules and Tarzan all the time, and I had them memorized like by accident. I knew everything. And one time, I remember I was video chatting with a friend of mine, and we kept referencing Prince of Egypt and just making jokes about it. And they were like, "Do you have the whole movie memorized, Jordan?" And I was like, "I don't know. Let's see." And so I just quoted the whole movie just. <laughs> Just like that. It took an hour and a half to do it, but it became more amusing the longer it went. <laughs> I 
I don't know if I have that ability anymore, though. It's been a while. <laughs> but that's the thing is, you know, something I was in sort of an art drought for a little while. I, I think it was making the woodcut tutorial kind of killed me. It was just so, so hard and time consuming. And I was just exhausted. So mm -hmm. I didn't feel like doing anything. And every time I started thinking about it, I was like, oh, maybe I should do a bread fairy piece because I have one that's like almost done. And for some reason, I can't get myself to do it. It just felt like too big of a hurdle. But I, I've had so much fun <laughs> doing these paintings over air. And I was like, oh, my God, I just want to do this forever. So there is definitely something to be said about the fun part of fan art that I think is sort of inherent, don't you think? Yeah, I think I think that that makes a lot of sense. Sorry, I was kind of like sidetracked in my brain. <laughs> I was like, get this. Um, that happens sometimes. It's hard to draw and talk sometimes, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lack says, any insights about the mental traps artists usually fall into? I think having a good mental state is as important as having good technical skills. Oh, I think it's more important. You can have the world's most incredible drawing skill. And if you can't, jump off the cliff <laughs> and get started, it's not going to help you. And I do find, Jordan, I, I need to pump myself up before I draw. Do you ever have to do that? All the time. That's why I play music a lot when I'm drawing, because um, especially, you know, something that I really, really like, I can get into the music and I kind of associate music with having a good time. And so I can, I can kind of live off of that. But also for those of you guys who are struggling with uh, with some with the thoughts you have while working, we do have an artist wellness channel in the Discord, which uh, you guys can talk about some things that you're struggling with, and we and the community will help try and help you overcome those things. I think it's super important to have that community to um, to not facilitate, but just help guide you along the way when it comes to the artistic struggle. We've got Finding Nemo, Eternal Sunshine, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Robin Hood Men in Tights, Spirited Away, The Incredibles, The Matrix, How to Train Your Dragon, Finding Nemo, Star Wars, Arrival, um, Musicals, Young Frankenstein. That's cool. And I think sometimes, Jordan, it has to do with um, the generation because I showed Princess Bride to my kids because it's such a big part of my childhood. And they were like, eh, <laughs> which kills me. You know, when I was a kid and if we had, and I grew up in LA, you know, so if we ever had a rainy day, we would often watch a movie. For what reason, I don't really know because it's not like rain stops, should stop you from learning things, although we appreciate it as kids. And so all the girls in the class wanted to watch Princess Bride and all the guys are just like that movie does not sound like something we want to watch. And so we would just ignore it. And so even though I've seen clips so many times, I have no idea what the movie's about. Because I'm like, nah, I'm going to play with my baby blade. That's, that's what I watch. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was seven. <laughs> Any movie that has a line like, there's a shortage of perfect breasts in the world. It would be a shame to damage yours. <laughs> Which is what Wesley says at the end when Buttercup's about to kill herself. <laughs> really good yes you know we never got past that part we might have gotten 45 minutes and and it was just like uh, who wants to see this i would just draw stuff and eat my lunch that was my life well if you're seven i can understand yeah like most most seven-year-old boys are like nah i'm 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 trying to watch like something action packed some cartoons or something you don't want to watch anything romantic or anything, like any love story like no mm -mm. Then, Drew is asking, what do you do when you have too many papers with drawings and sketches and half-finished pieces piling up? How do you pick what to keep and what to part with? I really don't part with anything because you know something? Unless it really is taking up space I don't have. I mean, yeah, like I have so many figure drawings I did on newsprint. Like I'm not going to keep all those, but stuff like this. So these are... um. This is the painting I did. Actually, let me contextualize this a little bit better. It's a little confusing. Okay, so I did, this is a painting 
but I didn't like the text. So I went into Photoshop and I removed the text and I, I printed out pictures of that. And then I painted the lettering in the black. And I did like, I don't know, six of these because I wanted to try out, okay, does it look better with Moulin Rouge? Does it look better with L'Amour? I even did this one, which is like a blue background with an outline because I wanted to play around with this. So yeah, these pile up, but to me, it's like a record or history of the work. And so sometimes, yeah, in the immediate moment, maybe it's not helping me, but it is fun to go back and revisit old work. Do you think, Jordan? Oh yeah, I never throw out my artwork. Only time I throw it out is if I'm 20 seconds in and I rest, messed up royally, like with perspective or something, and I know I'm not even going to get close to finishing it. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll keep everything in cubbies and drawers and files and stuff like that. And honestly, if you're a 2D artist, it's not that bad. I, I think if you're a sculptor, that sucks <laughs> because sculpture is horrible to have to keep track of and store. But for 2D, you just stack it up in a bunch of portfolios. You just never know when you might need something. Right. I mean, for art prof, I've had so many times where I'm like, oh, I wish I had this thing from a million years ago and that would have made a really good demo, but I don't have it anymore. So I, I just wouldn't get rid of it unless it is a major storage problem for you. Yeah. I mean, the other thing too, we have scanners, we have three terabyte uh, hard drives we can get at Best Buy. So you can always just digitize it put it somewhere and just not have to worry about it too much. Um, and that works for me because a lot of what I do is digital too. So it works there. And also, okay, so let's say you have some sculptures and you're moving and you can't take them with you. Honestly, most of the time, as long as you have a photo, it's probably okay. Unless you've got a she she New York City gallery career like Lauren, who's such a superstar. Her show opened last week. In that case, yeah, you, you probably shouldn't be doing that. But for most people, it, it's fine to just have a photo. Do you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. As long as it's, it's good quality, good lighting, good composition, you should be okay. Remember, everybody, we have one more April workshop coming up. At the end of the month, we are drawing cats. You can still register on the homepage of artprof.org. I just did a workshop yesterday on jelly plates and we had so much fun just nerding out like crazy. I always feel so energized after I teach one of the workshops and it was a small group. Our workshops are no more than 10 or 12 people. And so you get a lot of attention. I see oftentimes on places like Skillshare they like to show off the number of students taking the class. Have you seen that, Jordan? No, I haven't done any Skillshare courses. Okay, well, so if you look at Skillshare, they'll write on the page, 500 people are taking this class. And I'm like, that's cool, but why does that matter if there's no interaction between the students? Like, I'd rather see that there are 10 people interacting and talking together and supporting each other and the teacher being part of it than saying, oh, there's 500 people taking this class, but nobody's ever talked to each other because the key to teaching is interaction and engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I force my students all the time to say something during critique and I try and have them qualify their answer. Like, I don't I don't just go have them go like, oh, I like it. I'm like, you better tell me why or I'm going to force you to. <laughs> like, yeah. that's, you have to qualify your answer because it encourages critical thinking. And it's so fun because especially even with the Patreon group, it's like people really know each other there. And it's when you have that personal investment with the other students, it's everything as a learning experience, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I, I think that's probably my classmates are probably why I learned from the most when I was in art school. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's super valuable. Super, super valuable. Yeah, I told that 
you know, when you were a student too at RISD, I was like, listen, you guys are going to learn as much from each other as you're going to learn from me. So don't tell yourself it's just about the teacher because it's not. That's what, that's one thing about online learning that makes it challenging sometimes because it's so easy to just hide behind your Zoom keyboard, you know, and yeah. uh, not want to talk with or interact with people. A lot of artists tend to be very quiet anyway. Um, so sometimes that's reinforced by things like that, but you, know, you do your best. Sorry, I think there was a lag. A lot of people have said to me, oh, I'm so intimidated to like, you know, join the workshops and everything. But then it's like, once you break that ice and you get in there, you're like, oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> yeah, you find out everyone, just the person, you know? We're all just people. We all want our artwork to be accepted, usually. And, uh, you know, we'll make some friends. That's all. Plus, I have no qualms about kicking out people who are rude. <laughs> Thankfully, I've never had to do that. I mean, I think most people, once they're on voice, the filters come back on that people don't have when it comes to um, being online. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's so easy to type something rude to somebody you're not speaking to on voice. Right. But to actually say something rude to somebody on voice is hard. Well, yeah. for most people. Yeah, I, I call those people keyboard warriors. Oh, gosh. They're kind of like chihuahuas, I'll talk, you know, bite. Although some chihuahuas bite, they just can't get a whole lot of a, a big grip usually because their mouths are so small. Fav says, how many unfinished pieces does it take to make a finished piece? My issue is all the raw materials. You can do a lot digitally if you can. I mean, half the sketches that I did for today's fan art are digital. So this is the traditional work, but all of these are digital sketches. And I just found it so much faster than drawing things from scratch. Yeah, I mean, and you know something. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. You finish. The other thing is that I would rather just keep sketching and make sure I'm being thorough than to say, oh, I don't want to waste a piece of paper because I need to move on. So in, in other words, it's like I, I don't think, unless you really can't afford it, I don't think it's worth compromising a piece of paper for your artistic process. Yeah. If you can. I agree. I think you just want to come up with the best result you can and just try not to be stingy with your materials. I mean, I know I'm working digitally, so I have a bit of an advantage when it comes to that. But even this drawing, it took me a few sketches to get there. This is one layer. This is how I started. Um, and then I just did this one here. And this was next. And now I'm doing the final line art for it. And in a second, I'll add color. And so it takes a while to get to a place where everything's really solid. So Jordan, I, I went through all the process for this in my Instagram stories. I was like documenting the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I'm doing this, I'm like, oh my God, people must think I'm nuts. Like there's just so much prep work here, but it, it's like, it pays off because sometimes people say, well, I, I don't want to sketch because I want to have enough time for the final. I want to get to the final. I'm like, no, when you're doing this stuff, the prep work, you're actually removing time from the final because you've worked out a lot of the major issues. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I learned that lesson very clearly in your class several years ago when uh, you would tell us how important it was to have thumbnails done. And there would be many times where students would do the final piece and uh, do the thumbnails afterwards. And you'd be like, why didn't you choose this one? Because it's clearly better in every single way. And they'd be like, 
Mm-hmm. And then you'd be like, did you ask for your, did you ask for opinions? And then they're like, no, no, very clear that they were not following instructions. So yeah, take the time to, that you need to, um, to develop your process and don't be ashamed of using more materials if you, if you need to. <laughs> Harold is asking, what's the worst, most annoying comment you have gotten on art prof? I mean, there's so many. It's funny, Jordan, because some people say, well, I don't want to go online because I, I'm going to get mean comments and stuff like that. And I was like, listen, I didn't get mean comments until we had a really big following. So <laughs> it's once you start getting the troll comments, it's a sign that you're doing very well, actually. Yeah. But there's a lot of... Um, comments on this video we have about Kim Jong-gi where we have a debate about his work so I debated against him and there's so many comments about how I will never be half the artist that Kim Jong-gi is and he will be remembered and Clara Lou will not be and yes. oh gosh <laughs> that's that's mean wow you, you know, it's so funny because I was supposed to be on that video with my internet crapped out on me the day of. <laughs> right, right. Oh, man. I'm really, I'm still kind of sad about that, to be honest with you. Or then I think comments where I'll have a portrait stream and I will get lots of comments like this. The head is too high, you made the nose too short, the hair doesn't look good, and the ear is too low, and you made the mouth too small. And I'm like, really? <laughs> is this what matters to you? <laughs> okay, Aaron has a face. <laughs> he's there. <laughs> what? I mean, oh, he's he's, I'm excited. <laughs> he, he doesn't look as beautiful as he is, but he is like crying and singing at his heart out in this image this this is the reference photo by the way in case people don't know what i'm talking about and so this is the full image this is very theatrical oh my god <laughs> see you know you have a bad man crush when you just watch anything they're in no matter how trashy it is <laughs> I think it could just be any crush. I don't think it has to be a man crush. Well, um, yeah, you know, whatever yeah, crush. I'm sure there's, there's a couple movies that I've seen that was bad. Um, there's definitely a movie I've seen that was really bad just because someone I thought was gorgeous was in there. Um, <laughs> I'm blanking on what those movies are, but I know I've seen them. Well, so, Aaron, <laughs> he's in this really trashy show called Graceland. It's about these FBI agents. And the dumb thing, so the premise of the show makes me a little bit crazy because the concept is that they have this beach house and the FBI agents all live together. And so it's like this college dorm situation, but they're all FBI. I'm like, really? They live in a beach house? <laughs> and the two women agents constantly walk around in bikinis i was like okay this is dumb but he was <laughs> really cute in that show and so i'm like i'll watch it oh my gosh <laughs> i mean i did that with benedict i watched lots of bad bbc shows he was in <laughs> Sometimes you just need some eye candy, that's all. Sometimes. <laughs> Most times. <laughs> I was trying to be modest, but I guess not. <laughs> no. We don't need we don't need modesty. Ooh. That's a fun silhouette right there. Vanessa's asking, what digital art pad do you use? Um, right now I'm using a Cintiq. I believe this is 24 inches. Um, I also recommend the iPad Pro. That's a really good pro, uh, uh, hard piece of hardware as well. And I use the Procreate app. Um, as far as other apps that you can use or software, you can have Photoshop, which is what I'm working in now. There's Clip Studio Paint, which is really good. Um, 
Those are the two I trust, I'll be honest. The other ones I'm not really sure of just yet. But yeah. Oh, Claire, you know what's going to be fun about this drawing? I just remembered. I what? actually have the brushes that they used on Spider-Verse. Oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I signed up for a class with the art director, um, Patrick O'Keefe, and he gave us his brush set. So I'm gonna see if I can find it in here somewhere. Um, I have to re-download it. Ah, nope. There it is. Oh, I forgot. I need to take a photo. So I have my in progress shot. I get so anal about documenting my process mm -hmm. because every everything I'm like it's a learning moment. I have to capture this for people. <laughs> I totally get that. That's funny. Thanks, you guys. I knew I knew I would do it. It's just that like hesitation. Mm -hmm. Somnangelic says, I don't understand that disconnect between online and in-person communication. Someone on the other end of typing is just as real to me as anyone in person. Yeah, and I'm like, why would you want to be a jerk? Like, what, what is the motivation behind that? It makes somebody else feel crappy. And I can't imagine it feels that good to crap on somebody you don't know that well. I mean, if I have a nemesis... I would love to crush them, but most people are not my nemesis. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who the nemeses are. <laughs> oh, I have one from grad school that was very unpleasant. Oh. Really? What What did well, they do? I can't even, like, I don't know. It's like, it was so awkward. Like, we wouldn't talk to each other at all and it was a small program and that that sticks out when there's like one person you won't talk to did you ever like have a real issue or you just didn't talk we just didn't talk and i just oh hated everything about her <laughs> yeah that explains why you didn't talk okay exactly just everything about her just oh made me insane <laughs> I gotta get more reference for Spider Verse, guys. Don't mind me. I need I need a new look at Miles' suit. It's so sick. Well, speaking of references, guys, I think I need to look at the mood board some more because I need some. Oh, God, I can't. I can't control myself. Oh my you guys, God. look at his hair. His hair in the upper left. Oh my God. I don't think I'll ever fully understand it, but it's okay. The hair, okay, you guys have to back me up. Hair is hot on certain people. Hair is amazing on some people. <laughs> I'm sure it is, I'm sure it is. I just, I don't know who these people are, so. I can't Aaron Tveit, he's who he is. He is who he is, that's right. I, they're, fair enough, fair enough. Michelle says, what is that brush you're using? I really like the way it laid out the paint. It's a Sumi brush. So it's this type of brush. Typically it's used for Chinese brush painting and it's very, very soft. But the fun thing about it is when you wet it, even a very big brush, you guys can see that the tip is so, so thin. So I really like it. Usually when I use a Sumi brush, I don't have to have six brushes because it covers all the various widths that I want to have. See, Martinis agrees. He does have great hair. <laughs> I, I, I don't disagree. I just don't understand. That's all. 
That's all. <laughs> Who is that guy? Oh, I need to remind you. It's Aaron Tveit. He's in that Moulin Rouge musical on Broadway. And he was in the Les Mis movie. Yes. Victoria says, I love men with longer hair. It's hot. Yes. <laughs> Although, you know who looks terrible with long hair? Hugh Jackman looks so bad with long hair. I'm so glad he didn't keep that look. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a look for him. He did it for that terrible Van Helsing movie that came out a long time ago. And oh God, it is not a good look on him. <laughs> You sound rather traumatized by that. <laughs> Amanda says, poor Terry Crews, no hair, no problem. <laughs> That's right. We haven't talked about Terry in a while. Yeah, but see, Terry is more personality. Like, I just love his personality. Do you know what I mean? That's fair. I get that. He's a fun he, guy. He's just, he's just a little too buff for me. You know what I mean? Like, I love Hugh Jackman buff, but Terry Crews is a little over the top. <laughs> I don't know. Hugh Jackman dehydrates himself to get to that look in his movies. I, I don't know. I know he, you know, if you watch the first X Men movie, he looks really small compared to the way he is in the later movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, he's really like, he doesn't look like a Marvel <laughs> superhero in the first movie. Yeah. I have to pay attention to that. I mean, it's weird to me that the first X-Men movie is like considered to be old. It's like 20 years old now, which is nuts. That's how I feel about certain music. There's songs that I grew up on. I was like, oh man, this is so, so much fun. I remember this back in the day. And then I'd be like, oh, that's a 25 years old. Okay. Yeah, I know. Isn't that so weird? It is weird. I'm just, and I'm just at the very beginning of that. I know because of my age. So I imagine it's only going to get worse from here on out. Well, you forget. You're like, what? That was 20 years ago? Like, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. You think of all the memories, too. Manette says, love the facial expression in your painting. Dramatic expressions are so much fun. I mean, when it comes to drama and musicals i mean i don't think there's anything that does it better than that it's like especially if you're watching it live <laughs> airy says definitely done some solid art pieces because someone was mean to me i wanted to do something better than them spike can be productive ever so often you know what if you guys tell me you've never made something or done something for spite you're totally lying yeah <laughs> all right i need to dig into this red this red is like oh my gosh so strong Not exactly sure. It's relaxing it. for you, Jordan, doing fan art. It can be. Um, this is relaxing. Yeah. Right now, the challenge is just trying to see the textures that they put in here because you see they have all the little dots and stuff. So I'm trying to match that. I don't think I'll be able to pull it off um, with the time frame that I have, but it is a lot of fun. I need to do more bleeds. I'm trying to be more spontaneous with this, but it's hard. The ink is just so hard to control sometimes. Mm. 
Fav says, would painting frames from a film be fan art? If so, would it technically be fan art of the director and the actors? I I guess it's fan art. I I think that'd be more of a study, to be honest. Um, but it doesn't mean it can be fan art. I just think it, it would have a slightly different purpose because usually when you're doing something like that, it's to understand what's the composition, what's the color, what's the lighting look like. Um, so yeah, I guess in a way it's fan art. And, and and that opens up the discussion of, does that mean if you do a master's copy of like a Sargent piece or something, does that become fan art too? So that actually opens up a whole can of worms I was not expecting. Yeah, I think it depends on your purpose behind making it because my understanding of fan art is that you're making it because you have a hopeless crush on Aaron DeVate and it's not because you want to study composition which is to me what most master copies are about which is okay I want to learn this artist technique I want to get into their head a little bit and that's not really the same thing in my opinion as fan art <laughs> Carolyn says, I had a nemesis in my lab for a while. I still have nightmares of them hiring her back. Oh, it's such a nightmare when it's somebody you have to see every day. I mean, I'm lucky that I don't have to do that since I'm the boss and I can get rid of people if I think they're a pain in the butt. It's... But yeah, that's stressful. Yeah, that was what middle school was like for me. There were so many people I just <sighs> did not want to be around every single yeah. day. And then funny enough, the same people, they actually got expelled. Um, from my what? School. Yeah, I can't, I, I genuinely cannot say the reasons why they got expelled, but I was happy it happened, so. Sheesh. Yeah. Well, middle school's rough. I hated middle school so much. It was the worst. It is the worst, it really is. And you know, watching my kids go through it, it it's even more painful. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know what I don't like about being a kid? What I didn't like about being a kid is that you just have so little control over your life. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. You know, as an adult, if I'm in a situation and I don't like it, most of the time I can get myself out of it or figure out a way. And, you know, when you're a kid, you, you just feel like there are so many things. They're just not options for you. Yeah, it's definitely, it definitely feels helpless. And that is an aspect of early teenagehood that I do not miss in the slightest. Well, because so often I'll say to my kids, I'm like, do you want me to write a nasty email <laughs> to that teacher? Because <laughs> I will, if it's, you know, teacher being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. and my kids are always like, no, 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 I don't want you to. I'm like, I will. <laughs> Yeah, parents don't care. They'll be like, I will deal with them and their parents. Like, let's 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 go. <laughs> Actually, I, I wrote a very nasty email to the principal. <laughs> it was so nasty. And you know what? I think he was very scared. He never wrote back. Oh my gosh. I'm very curious to know what this email said. About. Instead, the email was so nasty that somebody else stepped in. Because they knew how to deal with it. The other person did not. Sheesh. Yep. I was like, really? You're, you're that embarrassed that you can't even reply? Like, I just thought that was pathetic. <laughs> he lost the round. He lost the round. Oh, he did. And, and my kid loves that I did that because the principal was being horrible. Because, <laughs> you know, I think... As a child, you need to know your parents are going to let that go. Yeah, I think it's super important to do that. And I'm not a parent or anything, but I can imagine how much that would mean to me if I was in that situation. Well, so somebody said to me, and I think this is really good parenting advice. Parents, help me out. Um, they said the mo one of the most important things about parenting is modeling good behavior. Hmm. 
I could, uh, that makes sense to me. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I, I see nothing wrong with that statement at all. Yeah, Michelle says, absolutely hated school, didn't really fit in, was a bit on the outside, not too much different from now, but now it's more often by choice. Yeah, it's the control thing, knowing that you have the option to get up and leave or yell at people, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I can do very, very easily. Reminder, everybody, Aaron Tevay wants you to know, we have May workshops coming up. We have one on artist applications, how to write an artist statement, preparing project proposals for grants and residencies, how to exhibit your artwork, artist websites, commissions for artists, and the two studio workshops are Fan Art Party and Sketchbooks. Jordan, what's happening tonight? Tonight, we'll be working on some more Shadow Boxer stuff on my YouTube channel, The Joe McFoe Show, at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Love to see you there. And thank you for the support. And a reminder, we are doing a stage session right after the stream. Please meet us in the post live streams stage channel to chat with us on voice. Hope some of you can make it. And think about joining our Patreon group. We have such a blast in there. You find support in a small group of artists. You get to share your art, talk about all kinds of art related topics on weekly voice sessions. And I provide lots of support and critiques in the Patreon group. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, portfolio critiques, statement editing, personal art curriculums, and more. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.